Okay, so thoughts, objections, ideas on this, on Kant, on whatever. Yeah. Um, I had a question about your analysis of the, I guess it's called the bather, the, um, mm-hmm. the meeting that we were looking at. Yep. And you, you were, um, you seem to suggest at one point that the figure barely seemed to have, have sentience, sentience for you, and that you, with the smallness of the head, that there's a sort of de-emphasis of the consciousness, and um, it seems to me that if you want to make the argument that the human body is intrinsically the a source of meaning, a human body is a body with a consciousness. And part of what's powerful about this painting is this, this very bizarre looking creature that we seem to feel as having some sort of experience. So I wonder why you me. wanted to de-emphasize the, the, the consciousness. Well, what I, what I meant, great question, great question. I'm um, trying to figure out, thank you for asking me, because I'm actually trying to figure out how to phrase what I'm thinking about. And what I'm thinking about is she doesn't strike me as someone who um, is going, when we think of, usually sentience is tied to the notion of pain. And it's very hard for us to think of her as someone who might feel pain, just as this monster, um, who I adore, um, who's, of course, made of nothing but bone. Her bones aren't connected. She's partially an insect. And it's pretty, I mean, while she's lounging on the beach, she will, when she's done, you know, get up and eat you for lunch, right? I mean, she really is a monster. Um, so to, so I don't mind the notion of consciousness, but again, there seems to me, if we think of sentience as connected to pain, it's hard to think of these particular monsters as feeling in that sense. So I said... I thought of her as before feeling, the way someone is before beauty, but not without sentience. Not without it, but not having it in the way that we normally think about it. Right? There's something opaque, even about the notion of sentience in this case. That, that was my thought. Uh, and, but I agree with you, it's a, a peculiar thing to try to grapple with. Yeah? So I'm wondering about the romantic side of the talk mm-hmm. in terms of the romantic fragment and uh-huh. how you set up the sort of parataxis and placing two things next to each other um, which Daphne and fragments are doing. But what I don't see is what's fragmentary. You don't get at sort of the fra- I didn't quite see how you, you get the view of setting two things together in which there's some kind of meaning that comes to the fore but in those what's fragmentary about that the space. Place. This is an, a non-coherent space, right? That's what I was trying to generate. The only place where this can exist is in your intellect, right? So there's no space you can, um, because my claim again is, and sometimes because people know the the drawings, Picasso made more drawings in anticipation of this painting than of anything he ever did. And in the original drawings, maybe some of you know this, in fact, there was a sailor and a young medical student. And the young medical student had a skull um, under his hand, right? And originally, the painting was some sort of allegory about venereal disease and memento mori and remember death and all that kind of stuff. And all that kind of allegorical stuff dropped out but so did the arrangement by which it was a, a conceivable space. So what I'm claiming here is, just, just to recapitulate, is we get a notion of spatiality from each body itself. Each body projects its own space, but not sufficiently to give us anything like a space that we could enter into, right? <laughs> That's a space you can enter. You know what it would be to walk into it. You know your way around it. The problem with Demoiselle is it's an utterly discontinuous space, just as the bodies are discontinuous. Right? So it is... Um, and again, I use, try to use her as my prime example. 
right? facing both backward and forward. Uh, so you can get space, you have an idea of the space she inhabits, but you can't actually figure the space out. Right? So it's the notion of implied spatiality that emerges from each body without being able to construct the space uh, or its depth or exactly how they are comported one to another. Now what that means is that only something like Kantian reflective judgment is going to be possible here, right? That you have to do all the work of holding this together. And I'm going to suggest you're going to always fail in certain ways. That you have to just you know, live with that continuity and discontinuity. So, as I was saying at the break, this is something much closer to the sublime. Right? Um, this is... Uh, actually what the sublime might look like as an actuality. Um, in the sense that it cannot be gathered up, it can't be comprehended, it cannot be held in mind, there can't be a, a perfect harmony between... So there's a reflective judgment going on, but just like Kurt Pillow said, that in art, the understanding follows the movement of the sublime more than the beautiful, I think that works here, too. I think the notion of the sublime and the beautiful join in modernist art. That's, that's the thought. Yeah? Um, well, so, from what you just said, I was, and as you were giving your talk, I was wondering what happens to the safe, the safe place of the sublime. We, and it sounded from your talk like you were saying ah, that it's precisely that safe place that <clears throat> falls That's apart. get killed. That's yeah. what we're getting rid of. Everything about art dependent on the notion of safe place, both in beauty and the sublime. That's what Picasso was out to destroy. He wanted you to feel unnerved, that you were unsafe. And even on one occasion, uh, Yves Lambois has a reading of the painting uh, about in relationship to the Medusa, and that these are castrating looks, really unsafe, right? I mean, so, so you want that sense that rather, so this is the shock of the painting, why people hated it. Because usually when you look at a painting, you're in command. Here, you walk up to this, and you are commanded. Right? Absolutely unsafe. Yeah. yeah. But then how is that sublime? I guess. It's sublime in respect, in two ways. Sublime, first of all, dominantly, because it, it's still a work of art. So that's the notion of distance. That's all the distance you're going to get. It's sublime, nonetheless. I mean, you know it's a made thing. I mean, you may feel, I mean, people hated it or nerve by it, want to look at it. <coughs> we do better with it now than they did. But it's an uncomfortable object. Think of, try to think of all the things that we look at with open fingers. We want to see and don't want to see. Right? Trying to get that ambivalence here. It's sublimity but resides in its incapacity to be totalized. Continual suggestion of totality while defeating it at every moment. That's what I remember. I said it, it has all the conditions of possibility of spatiality without there being the space they're actually in. That's the double game it plays. <coughs> yeah? So I 
think the notion of ugliness is always parasitic on an ideal of some kind. It's, it's always a primitive term. Sometimes the ideal is a moral ideal. Sometimes it's a religious ideal. Okay, so the, the, I guess, great ugly painting is, is the Eisenheim altarpiece. Okay, nothing is quite as horrific as, as the flesh. Which saint is it that has that greenish flesh? Anyway. Um, uh, so, I am not denying I think beauty is inevitable. Um, and therefore, it's always, we're always in a strategic relationship to it. Um, um, I take it we're attracted to ugliness out of, when we are, out of curiosity. That it's a version of something that strikes us as fascinating because it is so proximate to us and yet so freakish. And I think Arbus turns on that combination. And even I, I saw over, over uh, most of the break, so just this last couple of weeks, that terrible, terrible movie that, that just made about her. Um, but it did get at the thought of the casualness of the relationship to other Right? She wanted to naturalize the ugly as part of a routine. Right? And that's what the movie was about, right? How to naturalize, be, become comfortable with monsters. Hence the whole hairy man, you know. It was kind of an obvious movie. Um, and a silly movie. Uh, does that help? I, I guess ugly, so ugliness there is a kind of lure of wanting more to break our indifference and, 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 and so to capture us as something we can't quite believe and want to, to, to see. The desire, the desire there really is epistemic. Which I guess is pretty interesting by itself. That she gets, gets it's so desublimated her art, right? So unbeautiful. wants to say that's part of, of, of falling out of any, any norms that are regulating the conditions of what counts as art. I'm claiming, and they, therefore for him it's just, you know, everything goes. I'm claiming, no, no. Picasso's shift is from beauty to truth. That's my claim. That he actually shifts the game and wants to regenerate art by asking what could count conceivably as a true painting rather than a beautiful painting. And he's trying to find some way of forcing us into a different relationship to art, but one that is in fact far... So, and I'm specific, of course, I hinted that Matisse had a similar thought, right? That Matisse knew when he did the blue nude that he knew something that authenticity in art could not be about the beautiful. And he was hoping that something about like honesty and sincerity, meaning sexual explicitness, would carry the day. Right? And it was just, it's just, you know, <coughs> it ain't that. So what Picasso does, 
is try to ask, as good modernists have always asked, in virtue of what do we find a piece of art authoritative? And authoritative now is not high craft illusions, is not beauty. It turns out to be a irresistible claim to meaningfulness beyond anything that art had previously claimed in terms of meaningfulness. And indeed, in my account, because, I think, for Picasso, it's transcendental. But it's the body itself as the condition of the possibility of meaning. And you deform it as much as you want, no matter how you deform it, it appears as meaningful and expressive. So if I was to go back to my beginning point, with the weeping woman, I think the reason why this is an iconic painting is because it is, um, of course, this is a human face. So it's not, that can't be the story here. It's that grief is here revealed as a a priori modality of the human. That no matter what the human is, we cannot detach it from the possibility of grief. And that this has that capacity for universality. I just take to be almost trivially obvious. But I take it that that can only be a material a priori claim. Grief belongs to what it is for there to be faces at all. And it expresses that. So that's that's, that, that's something different from that. But I, yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> but I think if, if there was any other condition that he does allow, uh, for, you know, for something to be art, he would tell a different story about how it has it, but it would be meaning as well, right? Yeah, but here it's going to be a metaphor. It's all yeah, a series metaphor. of metaphors. Yeah. Okay. For him, it's all aesthetic ideas. Um, for Picasso, it is, and I'm not saying this is the only thing that art can do, but I do want to say that the reason why extreme art has become so prevalent is always variations on the Picasso that we are actually finding various ways of acknowledging the human. And it's always against what I want to call a high art purism. Uh, no, I mean, I think of the grotesque as exactly a categorical confusion. Um, I think he's a very bad artist. Um, and I think he's a bad artist because he doesn't know the difference between, I, I mean, Deleuze is perfect, here, between sensation and sensationalism. He just doesn't have a clue. And therefore, he doesn't know the difference between what it is to make a claim and to generate a titillating experience. Uh, I'm not saying you can't be shocked. Or, Whoa! I mean, you know, there's plenty of visual excitement. There's plenty of visual excitement in a Disney cartoon, too. <laughs> well, there is. Uh, it's not an accident that Disney's a rich man and I'm poor, right? It's much more exciting. Um, but, but that 
So, so that's the kind of discriminations you want. It's right? exactly why you want to be able to make those kind of discriminations. Um, and only by figuring out, and this is my claim, that, 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 that I think Picasso really is lodging a transcendental argument of a certain kind through a whole series of works, moving to, I would argue, Guernica, which is the rebirth of tragedy. Right? I mean, no other painter I know of in the modern world has tried to paint tragedy. Um, uh, Picasso really raised the stakes. So I don't think that we are fascinated by, I mean, even Richardson in, in, in his work does it, when everyone recognizes Picasso is a genius, he's a virtuoso. And we can say, oh, well, all we're doing when we love Picasso is love his virtuosity. And I must say, I had that thought myself for the better part of 25 years. <laughs> so, so coming to this has been a long struggle uh, for me. I didn't know what to do with ugly Picasso. Uh, um, I knew I liked those paintings more than I was really interested in Cubism. I just didn't love Cubism. I was supposed to, but I just didn't. And I kept, you know, thinking paintings like that, you know, caught my, and then I thought, well, I know I, I like bad movies too, so maybe this is part of just a... Uh, so this is a, an attempt to try to find an account about why we are, I think, rightly Amazed by the concept. It's part of what's behind all this. And amazed by those paintings that the big theorists tell us we shouldn't be amazed by. I mean, uh, when I presented this originally at a conference at Berkeley, it was, you know, uh, one of my conversation partners was Ben Booklow. And ben just thinks that these are regressive and silly and bad and awful. And he can't imagine why grown-ups are spending their time thinking about that. And just, that just shows a lack of judgment. What does he think we should be looking at? Uh, just that story of Dee Skilling. So, so, <coughs> through, I guess Gerhard Richter is his approximation to um, um, photography, and then what passes beyond that. And if you want a view of Picasso, then the Picasso Papers by Rosalind Krauss takes the book close story and reads Picasso in terms of that. And just says all of this is Picasso regressing into showmanship. Just that. Yeah. I was wondering about Picasso's relationship to Cubism. Um, I mean, he's certainly a
to be tested as far as possible, and nonetheless to find ourselves forced to acknowledge that we could only look at her. That's why I talk about acknowledgement. By <clears throat> having the comportment proper to another human. So I thought I actually did say we have to welcome her into our community. I thought that was literally my claim. I mean, I heard that too, and so the quick dismissal of the sort of Lebanonian phase, I just quickly like, Oh, the oh, it's, the it's, it's, was, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's because. Good. It's, it's because I think the, the welcoming in and the comportment doesn't automatically uh, click into to the effort. Um, I don't know what it clicks into, but what I want to say is, but that's what exactly what I find missing in 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 Levinas, or begged by him, right? That that it's immediately, you know an ethical relationship. Uh, well, I'm saying it's, it's immediately recognizing that the other is alive. Uh, that may, it may be something that has going to have the force of do not murder. Um, and I'm telling a version of that in my work on Victor, which comes out pretty much like that. Um, but I don't want it to be quick. And above all, I don't want to... <laughs> the thing about eyes is wherever there are eyes, there's a soul, right? There's soulfulness. I mean, not all eyes. But for example, horses obviously have souls and cats don't, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you look at a cat's eye, you just know it's blank, right? And, and horses just have these dreamy big eyes. And you immediately feel guilty for just, you know, Think, you feel guilty for thinking of them as an animal, right? Horses are very hard to cope with when you are face to face with them. Um, right? um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's because, so what I think is going on there is too much is learned, too much projection going on, too many stories at stake. And what I was trying to do here is rip away all of that or I thought Picasso was trying to force us to rip away all of that, to a point at which we had everything we could want in the way of being able to say no, and still, Serenus Paribus could not, could not. That's why I think the behavior by the sea is a great painting. That's why I think Clark misses her. It, it's the fact that we cannot dismiss her. Despite her stoniness, despite her. Yeah. Is that? So my notion of the ethical is um, begins on, it must begin on, on with thinner stuff uh, um, in the sense of, of a shared awareness of the living itself. Because it's aliveness, I said that, I thought was, was the primordial experience of the and not any particular, excuse me, psychological state or And that, of course, is why I think um, <laughs> it's aliveness as an object of perception that is almost nowhere to be found in philosophical literature. Um, so the question is, you know, are animals, they have consciousness? Are they like us? So we're immediately asking, and I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, you've run so many miles too far. You know, first figure out what it is to perceive a human being. And art raises the question in a way that no other 
no other discipline does. We're forced to raise it. Painting does. Which is, you know, the disappointment of Merleau-Ponty is, is, it's all first person. It's all my body. My corporeal relation to the world. My intending the world. You disagree with that? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> It's meant to accomplish that, but it, 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 it does it without doing it. I mean, it's, it's an insistence without an analysis. But of course, of course, it's supposed to be in, in between, first and all that kind of stuff. I don't think it actually does that. That's what I find extraordinary about these, these moments of Picasso. They actually do that. And do them, I mean, let us be clear, they do them in a puzzling way. I don't, I, I, I ended so firmly. Let us not forget, this is a painting. Uh, there is a living being there, but I'm saying that something like the thought of aliveness, right, adheres to the structure of the human body, right, just as what that form signifies as such. And it takes us nothing. I mean, of course, we all know from child's pictures. We can recognize the human, you know, with just, you know, a big round head, you know, it's a, it's a smiling face. You know, we don't have difficult. Yeah? I thought the Merleau Ponty would actually help your story. Um, because I take it even. Well, I don't think he's, he's opposed to it. Okay. I, I said the disappointment. Well, let me see if I can put it in the shape this way. Mm -hmm. uh, even in Kant and in Fichte, you have uh, notions of the body as a kind of position we have um, for orientation, right. Uh, right and left, and so on. And it's about our, and if I can use this word, sort of lived experience right. insofar as we are able to construct space right. in relationship to our body. Uh, so if we're going to look at a painting, which we have and see live bodies in space and understand the spatial relations um, in that way, then it seems that for those figures, which you're, in a sense, in some way it seemed as if you were pulling on, we are able to do that insofar as we also have this first personal stance. Um, so, so I just took your remark that sort of uh, dogging the first personal stance insofar as we so what you need to tell in your story, it would seem, would be about how our, our, our stance as a viewer, as a spectator, as embodied spectators, is what enables us to have a take sure. as these bodies that are depicted as living or alive bodies. Do you see? I, yeah, except I, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to do a kind of thinking thing here. I want to, and I'm certainly in, I want to, so to speak, make my awareness of the other's aliveness uh, antecedent to my own self-awareness of my aliveness as a body. But if reciprocal, even for it's reciprocal, it's got to be reciprocal. Of course, it's going to be reciprocal eventually. Right. Got it. But here, I'm just trying to, to, to get at that way in which it has that status independently of my intending it. Adorno Cole, who calls this, uh, the images we're talking about here, non-intentional images, right? And the idea of the non-intentional image is an image that means independently of our being <coughs> it. And of course you may say, well, how does that happen? Well, through a series of negations. I mean, it happens by taking away from the image all the things that we could think of as, as, as structuring the meaning of it. Right? And, and letting it just mean 
on its own. Now, of course, eventually it's going to have to circle back. I mean, we're not going to, we're not hyper-realists here. We're not going to have a hermeneutic circle. But what we're trying to convince ourselves of is that we're alive. That it matters. That this is, that this is, so this is meant to, and that's why I did like the Michel Ali line, that each uh, Picasso construction right, uh, makes uh, us more dense and more alive. That was great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think this is kind of related to the questions that Adam and Gabe are asking, but um, given that you, you want to distance the notion of life um, from our own sense of our own subjectivity or our own, um, our own ability to intend as some kind of consciousness. Um, so it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of reflective judgment, yeah, right? No, no, no. <laughs> so that I got. So just <laughs> given this, um, I'm curious about the Wittgenstein quote uh, that you started the course with when you brought up the notion of life. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is this is one I've also been thinking about for a long time, but it's the uh, that the human body is the best picture of the human soul. Of the human soul. Yeah. Um, and I guess what strikes me <coughs> is that if we're going to give up the idea that our notion of the other is somehow parasitic on our notion of ourselves as living beings, uh, and given that the term aliveness has a much broader extension than human who is alive, mm -hmm. what is the relationship between human being there and just kind of blank aliveness? Good. Good. And, and first of all, let me answer, I have no idea. <laughs> well, <laughs> nobody does, Jim. Nobody so. does. So that's not but, a bad thing. So um, um, but let, but me, let me get... Do you want to claim a priority? Uh, uh, well, excuse me. So let me just re-motivate this. It seems to me that you want to claim that our grasp on human aliveness has some kind of priority in our in our understanding of aliveness in general. Yes. Right? Absolutely. And that's why we obsess over animals and wonder whether they're like us. Right. Absolutely. Right? And so. that has to do with the human form, and that's the sense in which projection comes to play a role. Right? So the human form, so so that I'm, I'm willing to grant, you know, that is the best picture of the human soul. Right? You know, that's that's what grief is. That would be, you know, um, and there is nothing else for you know, us to think about. Um, and and it's in line with that. So my argument is is not that we are projective creatures, but we are analogical creatures, right? And that the only way we can, as it were, make sense to ourselves is by our capacity for um, analogical instances. So all the things that suffer pain like this, you know, we think should not be factory farmed. Okay, so, but I guess, okay, so I guess what I want to get at is what we're basing the rest of the analogies on. Mm -hmm. And I took it that human aliveness was that. So is the answer of what that primitive goodness consists in, um, that there all we can do is simply negate all the other analogies we have until we arrive at some kind of base level? Yeah. Great. Um, it's, it's rather this, um, and it's still a kind of Wittgenstein stuff, that, um, right? Because he says, don't think about consciousness, yeah. think about sure. the human body as, as the crucial thing. I want to say that or here's the hint I'm trying to track down, that these things are modes of aliveness. Rather than thinking of them as modes of consciousness, which I'm not saying there aren't modes of consciousness. Uh, I'm sure there are, um, like the thought we're having now is a mode of consciousness. But I even consciousness I want to think of it as a mode of aliveness. So what I'm trying to do is roughly put aliveness into our philosophical vocabulary, more or less where consciousness has usually held it. And I'm doing that 
uh, as a way of attaching right, um, a meaning to embodiment. So that consciousness then becomes a modality of that rather than something that has to... Um, and once we're convinced that that desire, grief, sadness, pain, um, um, when we think about Guernica, uh, the tragedy can just as truthfully be presented by the horse, right? As, as um, it's almost an unreadable picture of it, isn't it? Um, as anywhere else, and indeed, I think we're all drawn to the horse first. Um, So, so what I'm trying to do is, is trying to think of life as, as, the, as the notion that, that, that's the driver here. Now that raises lots of problems. Um, uh, maybe because plants are alive too. Um, although that thought, I should say, never worried Matisse. Uh, right? I think Matisse is all about the way in which humans are vegetables. What he's doing all the time is 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 finding the vegetable layer of human existence. Um, that goes some of the distance. I mean that that that's uh, yeah. I don't know, I don't know how I don't yet know how to extend that, but that's the intuition. I think that's also Michael Thompson's intuition as well, isn't it? I think that's what he's up to. Yeah. So you're saying you're the, the claim that grief is a modality of human aliveness, maybe equal or distinct from consciousness? Yeah. Not, not, uh, I just want, I mean, the problem of consciousness is you know, in the head. Um, and, I'm, and that seems to me the wrong move to think about human beings generally. That, you know, Robo Ponte is not absolutely right. Why he just seems inelimitable in certain ways, right? But the question is, how do we make a, how do we, how do we push the claim that think of ourselves as conscious? So, so, you know, Merleau-Ponty's seminal thought is that intentionality should be thought of as first as corporeal intentionality. We intend the world as bodies, not as heads, not as minds, not as seers. Right? Um, well, I'm equally wanting to say we can think of that on the flip side, which is what I've been trying to suggest with the notion of reflective judgment all along, that our notion of form is a notion of living form. Um, and that we <coughs> can get a very, because of the notion of expression, um, we can get very far along before we have to think hard about the notion of consciousness, of living beings as, as sensitive, as, as certainly sentient, etc., etc. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But you're, you're I'm preserving the same stuff. Um, your point about it being aliveness, let's say first, rather than consciousness, seems to undermine precisely why the painting of the, the bather. Mm -hmm. Because the only, first of all, uh, you know, as you said, it's not a person, it's a painting. And, you know, so Cecilia so Quest, you paint. And second, the fact that it's made of stone, the figure is made of stone. And so the only way to sort of begin to, to get the fact that that this is alive is to recognize the human form in it, which is one privileging of human life over our other life, the difference we all know we consciousness. And the other is is the certainty. No. I, that, that's 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 what I'm denying. That is I'm, I'm assuming that the smallness of the head, uh, I'm suggesting that the posture is doing all the work. That all we need is 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 kind of this, uh, and we don't have to think about what's you know what's going on in the head. Maybe nothing whatsoever, right? That it's the bodily structure itself and the way it intends the world, the way it feels the world, 
the way it feels itself, the way it has the capacity for motility, that it has proprioception. I mean, all these kind of things, right? Uh, apart from you know, strong notions of consciousness. But it seems as though we've taken away everything, Picasso has taken away everything that, um, that is a common link of aliveness between human alive bodies and other living things like plants. For example, in the way of texture or color or, or material, and yet is you know compels us to receive this thing as a lie. And the, the only way in which that can be located is insofar as it is human. So I don't see mm. that couldn't possibly be a privileging. I'm not. Oh, oh of, I didn't think. Oh, I thought I was privileging to you. But if you but that militates against your point about it being a lie and not consciousness. Why? I'm trying to get us to the strategy was exactly um, to try to find the acknowledgement of the human that did not involve, and this was my test case, the acknowledgement of another consciousness, whatever that meant. So I'm saying we knew perfectly well we had to acknowledge her, and that whether or not she was conscious or not looked like the wrong question. I wanted to drive that question out as the one that needed to be answered while having no problem acknowledging she's one of us. But it's, a, it's still a liveness that's centered on the humanness. Absolutely. So it's the human to, form. Right, but I, I don't know how to, to, to then begin to, to, to theorize a liveness in general. You know, that sort of interested in Wittgenstein's claim that our attitude towards him is an attitude, you know, to something alive. That we cannot take the same stance to a dead thing as to a living thing. And he thinks, in fact, he thinks, you know, we can do it, he does it with a fly. Um, my hunch, and this is the hunch that I'm just tracking Picasso on, is that all of those things that allows us to acknowledge the fly as this are analogical extensions of our awareness of the human form. That, so that there's no other form, perceptual form, that automatically will trigger and demand that stance right, other than the human form. Um, and I wanted to generate that form as a sufficient right, that it goes along with a lie of this. Um, and consciousness would be a modality mentality of, of bodily appearance, whatever that might mean. I'm not even sure what it might mean. Um, but I don't want you to be so sure either. Right? I'm trying to tend you away from thinking that we have to begin with, as if we know with, the fact of consciousness. Right? And trying to get you to a stance where it's your comportment toward another that is your origin of your sense of intelligibility in the world at all. That's the source. And, and you just want to say, well, but, but I think of humans as conscious. 
Um, but that was the point of the whole hour. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, what, you know, now connect that back to other types of life. Right, and then other living things. Sure, and the way to that is is um, going to be a story about possibilities of analogical inference. I don't think that compelling. I think that that painting is saying precisely the opposite. Like, I think of Wittgenstein's quote about we're not even tempted to pin. We're not at all tempted to pinch a stone. Right? There, there's something that we just immediately apprehend in a living thing, whether it is human or whether it is you know, a fly. And and I think that by taking all of those things out of the bather and showing us how we still perceive it as human, that it's sort of demonstrating the, the fact that we don't do things, um, perhaps that we don't think of human things as alive in the same way that we think of other things as alive. Which is an obvious point, but, but that, that, I mean, I've lost my train of thought, but I'm just sort of, I want to know how this connects to aliveness in general. It, it, it's the ground for the claim that aliveness is the fundamental thesis is the distinction between alive and dead is a necessary condition for the possibility of all meaning. So life and death is the origin of the possibility of meaning. And the uh, acknowledgement, therefore, of the human as alive is what it is to begin to have a meaningful world. Um, Now, what will that do to all the other things that we think are important? My claim is that's the story that has not yet been told precisely because we've always thought that what's important is consciousness. So that we thought we're separate from the living world, namely we're the bit of it that's conscious, rather than the notion of meaning not located in language, not located in diacritical difference. Not, you know, I'm saying that meaning comes with, with life, with purposiveness, which I would have thought is the driving orientation of the third critique. That's what it's pushing us toward. A purposiveness without purpose as where we start. Um, And I guess I'm trying to push that and not saying I know how the story is going to pan out, but I'm taking this going to pan out in a very different way than a conscious-centric conception of the world. Does that help? Yeah, I I still think we're speaking across purposes. Because you're arguing against the position that I don't endorse either. I'm not trying to privilege consciousness. No, I know you're not. I think other people... Okay, they can help. Right. (laughs) I'm sorry. Um, Yeah, despite the small head, do you not think that the the lady there by the ocean is sort of taking in this vast ocean and seeing? So so sight comes back into play here. In a sense, the ocean exists for consciousness and only for her consciousness, and that's why we're privileging her and not the ocean. No, it's not even clear to me she's looking out at the sea rather than uh, sideways to it or whatever. Um, I think of her as lazing in the sun. I think of her posture as just literally kind of eyes closed, just there. Now, someone thinks the way her leg is bent that she was actually moving, but I've never been able to see that. I don't see any movement there. So, so no, I don't think of her. I thought that, and, and the way in which the, the sea and, and sky are just flat blue, um, she's certainly monumental. She's the center of that world. There's no doubt about that. Um, and about that, Clark's right. She's a monument. She's sculptural. Um, but what Picasso is certainly doing is making her a pure object. So what is it to conceive another as another human 
who is nonetheless a pure object, not, as it were, a subject intending you or intending her own projects, but just there. I'm trying to get that just there-ness going. That's the way I think of her. Yeah? I want to push consciousness. Yeah, you would. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, but there's a one way you, you would do it is you would make sort of levels of consciousness. Um, and the basic level would be self-discrimination, a distinction between what is one and what is not one. So I, not I, at a really basic level. And you could even do that for, um, and so you need to make a distinction between different kinds of aliveness. So you have grass or yeah, trees yeah, yeah. and then bugs and so on. And um, there, you could then say, look, we have a kind of aliveness in which there is self-discrimination going on. It's, there's Whether in a functional way sure. or in a more robust conscious way. <coughs> and then you, so, so there, so there we get the kind, all the, the liveness that you're really concerned with is the kind of aliveness where you have to make, you need at least that minimal notion of self-discrimination and consciousness where you get the kind of aliveness you have for these beings that you're talking about, which then is the condition for recognizing other things as alive, like trees and so on. I'm not sure I'm following. Um, let me try a few steps to see what's at stake here. I'm certainly not denying that there's such a thing as consciousness. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Physical, but I'm not denying. Uh, yeah, not denying. Um, I am wanting to say that I'm puzzled about it. So that I'm sufficiently puzzled about it Especially if you say I've got to be self-discriminating, am I not I? In a very minimal. And what is well? I want to know how many. I mean, does Fido have it? Yeah. So does when marmalade, it, my favorite mouse, have it? So when a dog. We have a mouse in marmalade. Runs our kitchen. So when you're <laughs> when a, when a, when animals go for prey rather than for themselves, right? They make a distinction between what is. So an animal. They is make a, a distinction. There's a distinction operating. <laughs> <laughs> but now, but now I, no, yes, I don't want to be behaviorist, but I don't want to be uh, serious. I mean, of course, right. they have purposive behaviors, they have discriminatory behaviors, they feel all sorts of things, they seem to be, in any reasonable sense of the word, aware of certain things. Uh, but you've already laid on a, a, a layer of, of Self-discrimination versus, you know, that just seems like too much. And, and that's why I'm worried, because I am wanting to see how the notion of being alive in various forms, including animal forms, might take us further than, than some strong theory of consciousness. And to think of consciousness as a certain, as I said, modality of the life rather than something that is, is a, an emergent property that separates from it completely. And my worry about certain stories is it separates out completely. And I don't know how to avoid that without doing reductive materialism unless aliveness becomes the fundamental mode. Okay? I mean, Laplanche, I guess, comes closest of anyone trying to do exactly that maneuver in life and death and psychoanalysis. And he, he can't quite hold on to it, right? but, but that's his intuition as well. Uh, yeah. Uh, you said this up with purposes, uh, mm -hmm. that we start. Right. Uh, regarding Kant's conception, why shouldn't we start with uh, transcendental deduction, or, for example, with uh, ramification, the way it was done? Uh, in a critique of purism, why shouldn't we start with concepts, or why shouldn't we start with intuition, with imagination, or with combination of those cognitive powers, or why shouldn't we start with practicalism? Why should we start with, with uh, judgment, precisely, uh, as such? Right. Because the very first day in class, because none of those things 
can account for. So, so the line that I've been pursuing all semester long, this gives me a good chance to <laughs> bring it back to day one, is that Kant's account of conceptuality cannot account for concept acquisition, concept extension, concept learning. You need reflective judgment as a condition of possibility for conceptuality. Right? That was my epistemic justification for saying the first critique, in a way, relies on the third critique. But the third critique, I also said, in our awareness of individuals, involves some awareness of something that has form, and the notion of form has something to do with aliveness. Right? So that was the connection I was starting from in the very first day of the semester. But it is still uh, connected to uh, judgment as a process, not to, to the conception. I think in terms still of reflective judgment. Reflective judgment, still about right. that. But why, why is that starting point in, in regarding to other two uh, powers? Is that starting point? I mean, starting point into what? Only because, again, I mean, at that level, we had to go there because we can't have concepts without concept acquisition, concept learning, and uh, concept uh, uh, development. We've, you can't have concepts without those things going on. So we have to go back. And then you're back in the third critique. The, the difficulty with the first critique is it's a product of, without a process supporting it. Third critique gives us the process of, of, of engaging with the world that allows the conceptuality of determination. So the principle, no determinative judgment without reflective judgment. And now I'm trying to say our attachment to the world, the Picasso meant to say, there's a reason why our attachment to the world has to be through reflective judgment, because the origin of meaning is not in our conceptual discriminations, but in our original awareness of, of, of living beings. So this is, this is just the, the natural follow here. Uh, I mean, that's just the description, description of that process, yeah, the process of protective judgment. That doesn't say why it's more, I mean, it's kind of tautological in a sense. No, again, it's, it's a matter of presupposition. Determinate judgment presupposes reflective judgment. That, that's, that's the... By, by, okay, I mean, I, I still don't think it's less important than reflective judgment. I'm not talking about important. Important is a bad philosophical or word. Or less, I don't know, take a, a, a worse position in hierarchy, or lower position in hierarchy. Ours. It's presupposed. That's all I'm claiming. Which one drives? I mean, but that makes a difference to how you tell the rest of the story. What presupposes what gives you your your structure of the meaning of what comes later. Right? So I'm trying to give a deflationary theory of of consciousness right? and an inflationary theory of of of, of living meaning. Yeah. Is that living meaningful? I mean, I'm just trying to connect them. So, I mean, is it utterly abstract? Is it, I mean, uh, is it like, you know, being and non being as a category, as categories? I mean, I'm just trying to think of, I mean, yeah. you, you have, you've mentioned modes of this. And yeah. it, I'm still just trying to figure out, yeah, how that, how can they, I mean, well, the, 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 the the upshot of the story is going to be a story about ethics that's based on the notion of bodily integrity. Okay. Okay. That's where it's going. Ethics has nothing to do with anything but the preservation of bodily integrity and how we generate those norms from an awareness of the body as itself a kind of integrity. Self-preservation. Does that become a... That's from the wrong side. Okay. Well, a Hobson story. I'm telling a story about that our awareness of the world is already awareness of bodies as bounded beings. 
where the boundaries are bounded as things that are have normative weight. Hence, when I said before, the of the living and the dead is fundamental. It's fundamental on lots of levels, including the ethical. Um, I guess I'm still hesitant about your your focus on the human form and moving out from that, because it seems to me one of the wonders of painting is that, in fact, it can depict non-human forms in such a way that there's so much feeling in them that we react to them as if they're alive. And similarly, bad paintings, and you might argue like one of Renoir's nudes, you know, works off of a human form, but there's no encounter with any feeling, and therefore certainly no encounter with, with anything that seems like something human. In that, so it seems like the, the real focus for you is is somehow feeling, expression of feeling, intensity of feeling, and that is actually at least in art, it's a separate issue from whether you're working off the human form. Um, what I'd have to convince you of is that in a Chardin still life, it's just riven with the human form, all of it. See, I would say it's it's full of life, but why reduce it to human? Why call it human? And the same um, thing with a the, Mirandi. You know, why why say that's human form? Um, my hunch is maybe this was the question. Uh, my hunch is is we key off of the human form that we learn the meaning of life from the human form and um, analogically extend. And the only reason I think that, I should say, is, is, is a, uh, a guess about uh, developmental psychology. That is, we know now that babies, infants, even in the first week, can discriminate you know, the faces of, of you know, a living person from a thing. And it just looks like that's how things get going now. Um, and I'm tempted to think that those two structures are just irreducible to one another, and that we just build all the time to discover which is closest to which side. So thing, non-thing, or thing, living thing is going to be the crucial one, right? where the living thing is always, and, 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 and we are struck by the living ones as relevantly like us, in the plant ones. <clears throat> Do I think it's a mere of material a priori? Well, I think being alive is. Let me explain why. Let me explain, uh, let me explain why I think you explain that. Um, <clears throat> the thesis that it's a material a priori means that we do not apply it in terms of characteristics. That is, there's no set of criteria that an object has, like being red or being self-moving, or that um, sufficient for the application of the concept alive. That rather, the alive is the way in which is the fundamental attitude toward which we have towards things that legitimates the application of other predicates to it. Okay. So, uh, does this mean we don't make mistakes? We make mistakes all the time. Right? Uh, 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 Adorno says that that Primitive man had this animistic world where everything was alive, right? And, and nothing was dead, right? Nothing was a thing. And in the modern world, we treat everything as dead and nothing is alive, right? But that's the story of life. Um, but that they are, but finding the right way of doing that, I mean, my, my thought is um, that distinction is the one that that needs to hold if any other distinction is going to, because it's a material a priori. That is because it's what licenses other predicates. It's not something that we apply to an object. That, 
that's why I, why I call it a material a priori. So your question is it a material a priori even when I'm guessing whether a thing belongs to or not? Um, is It remains a material a priori predicate. Um, it just so happens that its extension is not fixed. But it, it, it's nonetheless, and that's why you know, I gather the Pope uh, is now going big on the idea that we are lords over creation because he thinks environmentalism is a bad thing and reminding us we're meant to rule the creatures. <laughs> bad theories and probably Yeah? Um, I think the point you just made is exactly why I want to resist always bringing it back to the analogy to the human form because that sounds like that's a sort of a characteristic whereas I think that the sense of aliveness is actually something that is felt. I mean, that's how we make those discriminations, by feeling, not by, oh, look, it's got, you know, this or that form that looks like a human form. So I feel like, in a way, you're you're still being too, so, you're being yeah. too intellectual about it somehow. So, <laughs> last shot, it's quarter for left. So I'll stop here, but here's... If it's a material a priori, then Wittgenstein's word is the right one to think about here. It's a fundamental attitude. That is, our accessibility to an object in its aliveness or in its being a thing is not a, right? It's rather the stance we take toward it that makes available to us the appropriate responsiveness, right? That I absolutely agree with. So it cannot be a pure intellectual determination. But we do discover right, that sometimes our attitudes misfire or you know, in either direction. Um, so it, it is a matter of something more like transfigurations or conversions or changes of heart that makes us see or not see things in the appropriate way rather than, you're right, building of explicit analogies. I agree with all of that. I just want to take it back. There's a paradigm case, and I don't think I could have done this. I don't think Picasso could have done this argument with um, with the having that force with anything other than human being. So it was a painting of a sculptural horse enjoying the sunshine. It wouldn't be anything to us whatsoever. I think it would look like a sculpture of a horse. Um, um, of course, it's a representation of a horse that we're familiar with. The problem why the, the, the the difficulty why the argument doesn't get made with other objects is because, remember, he's working against certain idealizations here. He's trying to show that even if we peel away all those idealizations, there's something authoritative we have to acknowledge. Um, animals are not burdened with those idealizations. They're burdened with other reactive formations, and therefore, there's not going to be that question of authority there. The only thing I could think of that would distinguish <coughs> recognizing the, the humanness of, uh, of the female figure in the, in the painting and, say, the horse, uh, is that with a female figure, we can um, not necessarily in any kind of mental capacity, but there's a, you just you get a strong sense of the physical experience that the human form is having. And with a horse, we wouldn't get a strong sense of the physical experience that it's having. But what's important is the, the recognition of a physical experience. And I, I take that to be what is so compelling about the aliveness of something is that it's, we can recognize in it the something physical that we can relate to, a physical undergoing. I 
I certainly agree with the conclusion. I, I, I would contest the first statement. That is, we automatically recognize sculptures of horses as horses, but they don't generate the attitude appropriate, right? You're not, as we're, because it's already a horse. You don't have to include it or exclude it, right? Uh, we don't think of it as, especially the horse, you know, packed with all those soldiers. You know, when we see pictures of that, it doesn't strike us as, as if alive. Right? But yet, when we think of a sculpture, where our whole set of relationships about it, what is the feeling? What are the attitudes? What's the so I mean, very different. So I don't think I, don't, I think our, our responses are really significantly different. I, I don't think that painting would have shocked us with a you know Stubbs is not our model artist. Stubbs is not the Angra. I mean Stubbs is the Angra of horses, right? But I don't think deformed horses have the same structure of, of problems. Okay, we need to stop. Uh, that's the end of the course. <laughs>